Oh, God, you're so good. Praise the Lord. Wow, we come from the service we've already been having. We've been, our hearts have been touched. We've been uplifted. We've been strengthened by the very Word of God and all. And now we go to a title of a sermon like this. <laughs> What's up with that? A peanut butter and jelly sermon. I mean, what is up with that? Our text will be coming from two places in Scripture, the book of Psalms 1. Psalm 1, it's on page 431. There are Bibles there in the pew, and you can take that Bible and open to page 431. You'll find that passage of Scripture, and then a little bit later, we'll be going to John 15, and that's on page 876. Um, but uh, let's, let's talk about a peanut butter and jelly sermon. Uh, back in junior high... Uh, my brother and I, our responsibility was to make our own lunches many times. Uh, if you want to have a lunch at school, you make it. Uh, because, you know, that's part of growing up. You learn how to do things. And so uh, that was the practice. But one day my dad said, hey, I'll make your all's lunches. So uh, don't worry about that. Just get ready and I'll make your lunches. Oh, great. Thanks, Dad. So, uh, you know. Got to uh, school that spring day and had my little brown bag in my hand and it came time for lunch, went into the cafeteria, sat down, opened it up and there it was. It was my, you know, this was the sandwich my dad was known for, <laughs> peanut butter and jelly. And so I took a bite and I couldn't bite through it. So I tried again, could not bite through it. I took another bite and on that corner and I pulled back and there was sticking out of that bite that I had taken a corner of an index card and it was wrapped in another sandwich baggie, you know, that the sandwich had been in, but here's a little baggie. And so I, I peeled it up and that's how I knew what day it was. It said, April Fool. <laughs> <laughs> PB&J, isn't that great, you know, PB&J, peanut butter and jelly, but peanut butter goes with a lot of things, doesn't it? Peanut butter, bananas, I've tried all these, peanut butter and syrup, peanut butter and honey, peanut butter and sugar, peanut butter and pe uh, 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 potato chips, uh, dill pickle, peanut butter and dill, I've not tried that, I'm going to have to try that. I could see a bread and butter pickle, but any other concoction? Peanut butter and tomato. Yeah, I don't like it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Any other suggestions? I like to dip my peanut butter sandwich in my uh, chicken noodle soup. You like to dip your peanut butter sandwich in your chicken noodle soup. <laughs> Isn't that, we're learning a bunch of culinary, you know, wonderful things to learn. Maybe one of our church dinners, let's have peanut butter sandwiches and chicken soup. I mean, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, m my dad's most favorite peanut butter sandwich was, he, he called it his triple decker. And what it is, he'd make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and, and then he would take another piece of bread, and he'd put mayonnaise on the top of this one, and then mustard over here, bologna and cheese, put them together, and that was his triple. Uh, they are awesome, I just want to tell you. They're really good. They're really good. Well, well, let's talk about peanut butter and jelly. Can we do that? Let's talk about peanut butter and jelly. Because PB&J, that's what it stands for. What's the best kind of jelly to go on a peanut butter sandwich? The one that's on your sandwich. The one that's on your sandwich. That's a good answer. Any one I heard over here, any kind. Yeah, well, grape, I think, is the common one. But there's a lot of good ones out there. You, did you know in the former Soviet Union there is no grape jelly? They do not make grape jelly. In all the places we lived, and all the places that we looked for it, it, we never found grape jelly. Found it once in Moscow at a Western store that sold Western stuff. They had Pop-Tarts and stuff, and they, they had a little jars of grape jelly. But, so we went with blueberry and other flavors while we were overseas. But it's just something about grape jelly and peanut butter, right? So a peanut butter and jelly sermon, what is this all about? Well, look on the cover of the bulletin. Where do peanuts grow? They grow in the ground. They are a part of the root system of the peanut plant. Where do grapes grow? On a vine. On a vine. They're the fruit of the vine. So you've got root and you've got fruit. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about a peanut butter and jelly sermon. But here's, here's the main point. No root 
no fruit. If you don't develop your root system in faith with the Lord, you won't develop the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of a gospel witness, the fruit of being able to live and, and, and to just be a, a godly presence in your neighbors, your family, your friends' lives. No root. If it's not developed and grown strong, you will not have fruit in your life. So let's jump in, okay? Let's begin with the root, Psalm one. Now, let's open there. You know, one of the tricks that I was taught years ago is if you'll take your Bible and open it right in the middle, you come to the book of Psalms. I did this three times this morning, and I got the book of Isaiah all three times. <laughs> but I just opened it to Psalms, so it can work. <laughs> but we want to go to Psalm 1, and let's talk about fruit, or excuse me, the root. Blessed is the man, pardon me. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. So not the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. How can we grow a root system that helps us be strong in the Lord so that we then can develop and God develops in us the fruit that he wants to develop? Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But then also the fruit of a gospel witness through our life. The fruit of just living a godly life before the world. How can we do that? Well, number one, trust God's word. We ought to just end that right there. Trust God's word, but not the popular persuasions of the world. All through the generations of our world's existence, there have been the popular persuasions of the time. Then, now, and like buy into the popular persuasions. Buy into what's, what's the key cause of the day. But it tells us to trust God's word. Did you see it says in verse 2, in his but his delight, the, the, the blessed believer, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law, on his word, he meditates day and night. We spend time in God's word. We trust the word of God for what it teaches us and what, it, what, what we can learn from it and how it changes our lives. But, but you notice in verse 1 that it talks about there is this pervading popular persuasions that are always out there around us. And it talks about things a believer, a blessed believer, doesn't do. It tells us there. Look at verse 1 again. Blessed is the man or the woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Do you hear the, the downward spiral? Do you hear how you can be drawn into the popular persuasions of the world? See, the blessed believer does not do certain things. They avoid bad company is what they do. But we don't. You know, they know there are people they will not walk with. That's what it says. They do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Blessed believers know there are people they will not walk with. Uh, I've mentioned a, a few handful of times that friends are a lot like elevators. They what? Take you up or down. They take you either up or down. There are just those we do not walk with. As followers of Christ, we give a witness, but then we are walking with the Lord. There are people we will not walk with. There are places that we will not stand or stand in the way of sinners. Sinners are on a path that's broad and wide that leads to destruction. We don't stand on that path. We do not stand with people who are in that place. And there are seats we will not take. Do you see? Or sit in the seat of mockers. Oh my, you, you hear it. You hear it, those that mock the things of God, those that, you know, scoff at the things of God. Oh, but the blessed believer doesn't mess with that stuff. The blessed believer recognizes it for what it is. It's popular persuasion. 
We trust the word of God. Do you see what the outcome is for those who are drawn into popular persuasion? Look at verse 4 and 5. Not so the wicked. You see up in verse 1 it says there are the wicked, the sinners, the mockers. Verse 4. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff. Their lives are empty. I mean, they might have intellectualism. They might have popularism. They might have the going cause of the day. But they're chaff. Now, God loves them. He wants them to be saved. We want folk to be saved. No matter what persuasion you come from, God can help you and walk with you and change your life and give you a future in eternity. But there are those that just refuse. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. They're going to be on their knees saying, Jesus Christ is Lord, whether they want to or not. They will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Notice the last verse, sentence. But the way of the wicked will perish. And so we trust God's word. We also trust the process. We trust the process. God is desiring to grow strong roots in our lives. And so we trust his work. Now here's the secret. No one's ever going to look at a fruit tree and say, wow, what a great root system that tree has. <laughs> and they're not going to look at a, a blessed believer and say, wow, they must have strong roots. But that's where it comes from. The fruit only is available and visible because of the roots that are developed in a believer's life. And so a blessed believer trusts the process. It takes time and it's worth the process as well. You know, roots give strength against the prevailing winds. Now, the word prevailing just means the, the winds that are coming at you. Um, that's not a negative or a positive word. It's just that the winds of life, as they come against us, good roots give us strength against prevailing winds. We know how to face those things. Uh, Corey Ten Boom, beautiful lady. She and her sister Betsy were put into a Nazi Germany, uh, Germany uh, uh, death camp because as Christian girls um, living in a Christian family in Holland, her parents had brought in Jewish families to try to protect them, deliver them from the hands of the evil of what socialism and what um, that was going on, that fascist stuff. And so they were trying to protect them. They were caught and put into a death camp themselves. And her sister Betsy died in the camp. But Corey Ten Boom, God delivered from that so she could tell her story. So he would get the glory and the praise that even in the midst of that hellhole, she was trusting the Lord. She said this. She, excuse me. Uh-oh. I'm ahead of myself. I apologize. Huh. Did I already pass it? I don't think so. Well, anyway. <laughs> what she said was, don't, tr don't be afraid to trust in the unknown future because you know the known God. Don't be afraid. We'll probably visit this again in just a minute when it's in the outline. <laughs> But we trust ourselves. We, we, roots give us strength against the prevailing winds. There are those winds that build character. And there are also those winds of cultural persuasion. There's winds that build character. See, the prevailing winds. You're, when the winds come at us, sailors learned a long time ago when you're sailing your ship, whether it's under sail or it's under the power of, a, of an engine, that you point into the wind... Because when you point into the winds, you can then buffer against those winds. You can have victory. The word prevail means to be victorious. You can be victorious over the winds that are pushing against you. But they also know you don't turn to the right or to the left because those winds will now hit you in a broadside, begin to drag you around. You don't get involved with those prevailing winds, the, the cultural persuasions that are blowing. And worse, you don't turn your back on the winds because then it'll come up upon your stern. You don't do that. And so you head into the winds. You trust the system. You trust God, the process. And you head into this, what the Lord 
wants to offer. You know, there are trees that when they were building ships out of wood that they would look for, and they were the trees on the outside of forests because they were the ones that took the brunt of the storms and the winds, and so they had grown strong uh, grain within those woods, and they used those to make the, the beams inside of those old wooden ships so they'd be strong. And, and so prevailing winds are, are not bad, they're not good, they, they're just there and it's life. And, and so you trust the process, you head into the winds by trusting God and, and he'll see you through. But if you allow those winds of cultural persuasion and you turn to the right, and you, you know when you're driving your car, those of you who are driving, and, and you know, you've, you're driving along and, and you just you look at something, have you noticed how it can cause you to drift? Or in the other way, and it causes you to drift. And once you start drifting, it, it can be very dangerous, you know. And so we, we keep our eyes focused through God's Word on His plan and what He's asking of us. There's this, what is the phrase of cultural persuasion? It's been since the day of Adam and Eve. Go ahead. Everybody's doing it. The devil made me do it. There you go. Yeah. But go ahead. Everybody's doing it. Eve must have said it to Adam after she bit the apple and gave it to him who was with her, by the way. Go ahead. Everybody's doing it. Only one at that time who was everybody. But now, that is the phrase. I mean, it's always been that phrase. Go ahead. Everybody's doing it. But there is this show out, and we talked about it in Sunday school today, called The Chosen. And uh, some of us have had the opportunity to, to view that. Um, the opening credits on The Chosen, um, it shows these artistic fish swimming of different sizes, all swimming one direction. And all of a sudden, there's another fish going the opposite direction, going against the flow, going against what was considered the right direction. And then after a bit, there's another one, and another one, and another one. You see, we don't go with the flow because it's popular, because it's easy. We go with the Lord. And that's not easy. And in most cases, it's not popular. But we trust God. We know His plan. And we know that we can trust Him in the way we should go. There's a fellow by the name of John Mason, and he is quoted to saying this, Christianity does not progress with the times. You know, we don't just, oh, well, here's the new popular thing. We need to adjust this in order to be able to fit that. Christianity doesn't progress with the times. If it did, it would be a false religion, and that's very true. If it, if it if it's, wasn't true then, but it's true now, and, and, that, and it's false. Do not be deceived into thinking that there is a progressive form of Christianity. Now, there's many out there who would say there is, and there are many pulpits who would preach there is, but there is no progressive form. It does not exist because truth never changes. Truth is a person. His name is Jesus. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. You know, that's God. Through this man teaching us, God's Word makes a difference. <laughs> you know, back in the days of the former Soviet Union, uh, the church went through a lot of hardship. There was a lot of attacks on the church. Marxism, atheism, socialism. Wait a minute. Are those words from when? And it came on the church. And the church, was, they tried to destroy. But there was a remnant of those who stood faithful with God. There were those that went their way. Or those who never showed up, never tried it because, well, the culture is, well, it's not good to be known as a Christian or to even be known as a churchgoer. But there were those who remained faithful, the remnant of God, who stood on the foundation of the rock, and that church survived through 70 years of the former Soviet Union. And the church today, because this generation was faithful, this generation was faithful, this generation was faithful, they were small in number, and they struggled, and they were put in prison, and they were arrested, and they were slandered in the public square, in the school system, everywhere, Born-again believers were slandered, but they stood their ground, and today the church is thriving in the former Soviet Union. Young people, teenagers, college age, are turning to the Lord. They're finding He's the answer. And it is so vibrant to see what God's doing. 
Oh, praise the Lord. We just give God the praise to see what God's doing through our former colleagues who are still serving in Russia and what God's doing in their lives. Now, there are many different persuasions out there trying to get us to turn our head that will catch us broadside and begin to blow us off course. But here's when we stand firm, we grow roots that are in God's word. Here's the Bible. It says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. No, we trust God's word. We trust his word. So strong roots give strength to the prevailing winds. They also stabilize growth. Stabilize, give stability. Uh, there's a town in Italy called Puzzioli. Now, when Diana and I lived there, when we were in the Navy, when I was in the Navy, and we were 18, 19 years old, and we were living now in Italy, because where my ship happened to be homeported, uh, we would drive through Puzzioli every day when I would go to the ship. Um, we called it Pozzuoli. We didn't know. But Puzzioli has three claims to fame. Number one, it's the hometown of Sophia Loren. Now, for some of us, that we understood that. And she was an actress and very popular years ago. She was, it's the hometown of Sophia Loren. It is also the town where when the Apostle Paul was on the ship sailing toward Rome, because he'd been arrested and he, he appealed his case to Caesar, they're now taking Paul to Rome under arrest, and they land where? In Puzzioli. Putioli, it's called within the scriptures, in the book of Acts. And that's where they landed. And then they walked and, and made the journey up to Rome. But the third claim to fame is that of all the villages and cities in the world, they have the most earthquake tremors of anywhere else in the world. 4,000 average a year. And when we lived there just north of Putioli, we, we were, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 kilometers north of there. But, but when we would be in different places, we'd feel tremors from time to time. They have learned how to build on foundations that can withstand those tremors. And so that's why everything still stands, even though they have all these tremors, you know, on a common basis. How firm a foundation is Christ our Lord. Amen. Didn't Jesus say, build your house on the rock, not on the sand? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Roots stabilize growth. So we, we develop roots in our lives. And it's through the roots that then the fruit comes. And so let's talk about the fruit then. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. The word of God says this. These are the very words of Jesus. He said, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener, the Holy Father, Heavenly Father. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. In other words, abide in me, remain. I am the vine, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. And this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. How do we develop fruit? Well, it comes from the roots we develop. And as we develop those roots, the fruit then comes about. Well, what's step one? Trust the gardener. Verse 1, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, my father is the gardener. Trust the gardener. We talk about trust the word, trust God's word, trust the gardener. God, who gave us his word. We can trust him to be faithful. In fact, here's that Corey Denboom quote. <laughs> Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. And the Bible has also that. It says what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So trust 
the gardener. You know, to remain or to abide means to live or dwell. Live or dwell with Jesus. To dwell, to spend time. Spend time together. For a long period of time. Amen? <laughs> How do we do that? We must stay connected. We've got to stay connected. Trust the gardener and stay connected to him. I mean, as we stay connected, he makes the difference. He, he helps us to, to abide with him. And, and it's kind of like a water faucet. Well, look at this. You see, Jesus is the vine, it tells us. He's the vine. He's the root. Um, and I am a believer, so I'm the branch. And then as the branch, the Holy Spirit develops through me the fruit of the Spirit He wants through my life to be known in the world around me. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of a gospel witness, the fruit of being a godly person. The Holy Spirit then works through me. But you and I control the spigot that whether or not the Holy Spirit will develop that. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of like your kitchen faucet. Its main water line comes from city water or from a well. And that water line, it's ready all the time to develop and give you water, right? And it comes all the way to the faucet, you know, the branch. But then you control whether you turn it on or off. But when you do, it's there. And it's the same concept with Jesus. He's the vine, we're the branch. And the Holy Spirit will develop in us when we allow the Lord to work through us. The Bible says don't quench the Spirit. You know, don't shut it down. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. And in that process, he'll develop the fruit that he wants to develop in you. And so how can we abide in Christ? Well, we walk by faith. We walk by faith. We put ourselves into his hands and trust him and his plan. Even when it doesn't make sense, we trust him. <laughs> there was a guy, did you hear about him? He uh, had his first chance to take an airplane ride. And he was not too crazy about the idea, but he did. He got on the plane, he flew, and he came back. And they said, well, how'd it go? How'd it go? And he says, well, it, you know, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It wasn't that bad. But I'll tell you this. I never really did put all my weight down. <laughs> <laughs> Put your weight on the Lord. You, he, he'll hold you. You can trust Him. You can trust God's Word. You can trust the gardener. And so we walk by faith. We also spend focused time with Christ. We do that by being in His Word, by praying, by meditating on God's Word, and asking God, develop your fruit in and through me. God's Word will do the work. Diane and uh, uh, Jackie McKnight and Laura Fisher were down in Branson Friday and Saturday, and they were participating in a women's ministry training uh, clinic. And um, Diane came home last night and was telling me how she had the chance to meet a second-generation Russian immigrant. And uh, her parents were uh, first generation, came over to the States, and then she was born here. Um, but uh, she talked about how her parents uh, were both sent to the gulag, the prison system of Russia. Uh, and they were not believers, um, but they were a threat for whatever reason to the current government, to the fascism, to the Marxism, to the communism. They were a threat. And so they were sent to the gulag prison system. But the, the mother's testimony of this, this, this lady, Diane Met, she's in her, the lady that you met, she's about 61 or two, somewhere in there. So her parents are elderly now. But when they were in the prison system, there was another lady that had smuggled in a Bible. And so they were reading God's word in, 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 in secret. They were reading God's word. They began to trust God's word and come to realize they needed Jesus. And this, this lady's mother got saved. And it changed her whole life. And then her dad got saved. And it changed his whole life. And then later, as they were released from the prison system, they came back to America. They came to America. And now she is here. And she gives praise and glory to the word of God. Oh, how we take it. How we don't spend time. We must spend focused time with Christ through his word. It really does make a difference in our lives. We also join God in His work. 
Sounds like experiencing God to me. We join God in his work. What God's doing, we join him in it because he wants to work through us and through our lives to do what he's doing and trust him in that. Finally, when we are involved in developing those roots so that we can see the fruit, we also must expect pruning. We must expect pruning. That's what uh, we heard Rochelle say in her testimony, but God's word Verse 2 of John 15, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. Did you notice Jesus, he said he cuts off every branch in me. Jesus was giving us words that when we read them, it would apply to you and I personally. That God is going to prune in me, he's going to prune in you the branches that are unfruitful, so that the branches that are fruitful will be more fruitful. He's going to take things away, and that might sound, oh, how terrible. No, God is preparing you for something even better. Because he's going to work in your life as he prunes some things and prepares for others. Our daughter, uh, Jessica, and, and our son-in-law, Anders, you know, they're doing a replant of a church that uh, just about died up in Nampa, Idaho. And they've been there for, oh, going on four years now. And God's just doing a great work in that congregation. Um, they were looking for a house for a long time. And uh, homes are crazy up there. And they're crazy everywhere, I, I think. Where, you know, a house goes on the sale in Nampa, and there's eight or nine people already lined up to go see it, and there's like six offers before the end of the day. And so they had just the hardest time even getting an offer in. I mean, they're a preacher in his family, so they don't have a lot of, you know... Not much. And so they would put in bids and put in bids and put in bids. And, of course, they were always outbid. But God provided them a house. And they were able to buy it now a little over a year ago. And they've been moved into it. And it's exactly what they were praying that, that they could have. It's a little over 100 years old. Has a lot of character is a good way to put it. But their property was developed a long time ago. By, and they have 16 fruit trees. They've got three kinds of apples, two kinds of cherries. They've got plums. They've got apricots, peaches. But the trees had not been pruned in a long time. So that's what they're doing this season is they're pruning and they're pruning. And they're taking those branches that didn't develop and they're cutting them off. It's not easy. It's hard work. But in the process, those are going to be stronger trees. And sometimes God prunes in your life and in my life. Sometimes he prunes in the life of a church. And in that process, God is preparing. And we trust the process. And so the main point, again, of this, well, here's the importance of pruning. It stimulates growth and it improves the quality of fruit. I just said all that, I think. <laughs> here's the main point. There's no root. There's no fruit. And so we develop the root. There's a chance that some of us here this morning established the root system by faith in Christ today when we prayed and just said, God, I'm, I'm ready to just put it in your hands and I give you my heart and my life. Please, Lord, save me and develop in me what you want. Whether you're in the fellowship hall or you're in here, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation in just a moment. When we sing that hymn, um, it's a chance for you to just come and say, Brother Don, I, today I, I wanted to make sure I was right with the Lord. Wanted to make sure my life was on firm foundation. And uh, so we'll close with this. Another verse from God's word. Jesus himself said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Lord, Father God, in this holy time, as we sing and as we allow ourselves to come before you as we just praise you in song. Lord, for hearts that are ready to, to make a public decision, I pray you'll guide and lead them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 415, softly and tenderly. Let's stand. We'll sing two verses. And uh, you come if God is leading today.
Please be seated.